Let me know if you guys can hear me now. Great, okay, looks like we have audio. So let's try this again and um, we'll sort of start from the top for everybody. So hello everybody, this is Rhiannon and Chat Noir in World. Um, and I want to welcome you all to the 11.30 keynote session of the Open Simulator Community Conference 2013. As a reminder to our in-world and web audiences, you can view the full conference schedule on our website at conference.opensimulator.org. And you can... can post your questions in local chat on the Ustream chat or tweet your comments using the hashtag OSCC13. We also have announcements for the meal break activities tomorrow. Tomorrow at 10.30 a.m., our silver sponsor, Avenation, will be hosting a meet and greet with their staff team on Expo Zone 6. And silver sponsor, Simudyne, will be announcing a new viewer for the Microsoft Surface and PC on their region at Expo Zone 3. So be sure to mark those on your schedule, and remember, even if you're watching the stream, you can come in world to the public Expo regions with your Hypergrid account. And now, I'm happy to introduce Cynthia Calloyne whose keynote address, entitled The Exodus to the Virtual Frontier, The Seductive Lure of the Mind Space, will take us on a glimpse of the future of virtual worlds and what makes them compelling. Cynthia as Lear Lobo is a researcher, professor, software engineer, and pioneer in the use of virtual environments for education, simulation, and modeling. In 2010, her team won the $25,000 grand prize in the Federal Virtual World Challenge. She is a professor in the Doctor of Computing Science program at Colorado Technical University, and in 2009, she designed and launched the Doctor of Computing Science in Emerging Media degree to encourage research in virtual worlds and web technology. She co-authored she co-authored two books, 120 presentations, and numerous papers. Mentioned 400 mentored 400 middle school students in Ramapo, Ramapo's virtual world worked with Will Wright on the TV show Bar Karma, and co-hosted the ISTE that featured Jane McGonigal. She is also known as Lear Lear the Insane in World of Warcraft. I have the pleasure of knowing Lear virtually for many years. She's a fellow proponent of the metaverse and one of my favorite elves. And with all of that, OSCC 13 is happy to have her here presenting today. Welcome, Lear. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Let's do a little sound check because uh, I can't hear anything. Can you hear? Oh, awesome. <laughs> well, welcome, everyone. I want to greet all our new friends as well as um, all of my old contemporaries from uh, vir the virtual world. You'll notice my title is The Exodus to the Virtual Frontier, The Seductive Lure of the Mind Space. Great. You can hear.
let's look at some barriers. Often people say, well, what are we going to do next? I mean, we've accomplished so much. And if you don't think we have, and I know we, ha we, we started a minute late, but please realize, back in 95 through 97, I was having to do vector geometry and plot the points and do the wireframing and do the rendering and calculate the lighting and shading and collision detection. And I want to tell you, that took forever, right? It took me a year to create a virtual space, you know, with, with a, a reasonable uh, fidelity. Nowadays, we take for granted how, how easy it is to fashion our objects, to res that first cube and to deform it. And, um, but our students and our newcomers, if we're wanting to get widespread adoption, which is what I think of when I think of innovation, I think of invention that causes others who are not part of the process to adopt it. Think back to Lethal Weapon. How many of you saw the movie Lethal Weapon? Um, Remember when he pulls out the car phone and it's that big clunky thing with, with the uh, handset that has a cable? Yeah. The old ones that cost $1,000 a month to operate or whatever. They're very expensive. Well, nowadays we take for granted our smartphones and this processing that we have that's similar to the mainframes that I had in the past. While they may not be multiprocessors, talk about powerful. So we need to work on usability. We need to increase w awareness. We need to think about interaction and how people interact with content. We need to think about cognition and how people understand and knowledge production, knowledge consumption. And then, of course, the installation procedure. There's still people who are so complex installing a viewer, right? I, I want to just use a, a browser. I want to use Jibe or Reaction Grid or I want something simple. Or like Sun Tzu would say, I want a thin client. I want it running on my tablet or I want all these other things. And so we have so many opportunities before us, but we also recognize that these opportunities come with limits. And we have to decide if we're going to go for complexity or stay with some of these limits. And you are all participants in these decisions. It's not any single one of us who's driving this. Now this scene here, and you'll notice all of my slides show scenes from my class projects. These, this is content that my students created. Students who had never been in a virtual world before. Students who didn't have mad programming skills. Students who didn't believe they were empowered, that they would ever be able to do this. And in 11 weeks or less, they create these incredible spaces. The one you're seeing right here is, is uh, Sleeping Beauty's Castle. And uh, as you go through it, it's interactive fiction. Uh, yes, and it's about 1,300 prims, and I, it is in Second Life, I apologize. I have to admit, I, I mostly teach in Second Life only because I need a stable platform that's always easy for students to get in and out of. So that's on my wish list. Uh, stable platforms, easy to use tools, great voice, wonderful uh, cadre of, of textures and, and content, etc. And she uploaded these textures and worked on this. And she uh, lettered her doors. So she has A, B, and C. So the, uh, one of those storytellers kicks off and tells the story to the chat log. And as you make decisions and interact with the magic mirror and, and the queen and various story elements, the huntsman, um, it draws you through the castle. And, and you get more and more of the story. And so you have alternate endings depending on how you want the story to unfold. Well. When I think of the Exodus, I think of, at first, the fact that we were all gathered together. And for the first time in my life, I had a sense of everyone in the world who was interested in virtual worlds. And I found that magical and compelling. I could go to conferences, like the one that Fleep and Desideria started in 2007, the best practices in education. And I, and I could commune with my fellow uh, you know, educators. And I could also listen to business and, and commerce folks who were creating content that educators de de desperately needed. Because you have to realize, not everyone wants to create their own content. Now, my students have to because they're doing projects. I no longer give exams. I do problem-based learning and activity-based learning because the, the learning retention is much higher. Lightful will be able to tell you out in the audience. Yeah, well, I remember it, Fleet. Uh, it was a wonderful experience. I couldn't res content because somehow I, I got added to the group late. So you know what I did? I res the student projects on my body. And then I, drug, I edited it and drug them out. So I showed merry-go-rounds and Ferris wheels and all kinds of, yes, she did. 
uh, back in 2007. And so when I think of the virtual world and its maturity, I think of each one of you. I think of the, your accomplishments and how you have fashioned what we know and, and enjoy today, right? Every one of you has participated in it. You may not be aware of it. You may not realize how important you are, but you are. So what was this exodus that occurred? I mean, um, we had this affordance of all of us gathering together, but it reminded me a little of the Tower of Babel in, in a sense, because when, uh, when Linden Lab announced their education rates were doubling and going to the normal rate, their timing was not good, right? Uh, the timing hit us right in the middle of a budget for a school year. And most school districts can't afford to double their budget in, in midstream. And so that caused a migration, right? That caused everyone a, a dispersal, if you will, not unlike the Tower of Babel. And I apologize for the metaphor, but that's what it reminded me of. That caused many of you to be very inventive, to look at open source tools, to look at different opportunities, to check with third party providers, to look at content creators, and to start thinking about portability of content. Some of you already had, and you'd notice that you didn't have academic freedom for your content. Uh, the Library of Congress, I believe, uh, purchased quite a bit of content in Second Life from educators, and unfortunately, they couldn't export it. And so, all of a sudden, digital rights and legal issues became to the forefront. Uh, so, so we had many drivers, and then, of course, the safe environment, right? The notion that we want a safe environment for everyone, uh, and everyone to be comfortable. So, so uh, that was the exodus. Now, Robin Teagland's here. She and Dominic Power wrote a book uh, at, at which um, they invited Doc Andy Stricker and uh, Peggy Sheehy of the Ramapo Project, the eighth graders, uh, the Safern Middle School Project, and myself to, to uh, write a chapter in. And we wrote a chapter on Gesellschaft and Gemeinschaft, the notion that um, community is important. And I'm not talking about the community you grew up with or the community you were born into. I'm talking about us. The fact that we have merged into a community and we may be loosely coupled. That's my phrase for it because I'm a software engineer. Um, the psychologists would call it, we're a weak tie network, right? We're not, we're not co-located and we don't get funding from one another. And yet there's a synergy that comes together, right? And here you'll notice um, I, I'm uh, not just building community. I like to hold dances at the end of my classes. And many of my counterparts at the university are like, wow, how can you do that? And I, and I think to myself, how can you not do that? Um, education is about informal learning and extracurricular activities and socialization and all the things that come together, right? And one of the components that's missing from online education is more socialization, more opportunities for informal learning. Think back to your early days. Did you ever sit around in the coffee house or, or the pub or, um, or a student lounge at school and, and philosophize about life and have grand thoughts? You knew everything back when you were young. Um, uh, if, if you didn't, you, you're missing out. I certainly did. And of course now I just kind of chuckle at the notion. So as we're building community in virtual worlds, we all have roles in this community. We're not passive. We're all active participants in one fashion or another. The people who foster business and look for sustainability in commerce are important to us. Uh, the notion of the freemium model and how it attracts interests and how it builds to, uh, to sustainable systems uh, is important to us. The open source developers, our hats are off to you. Every time we, we use a new feature in this technology, I just drool and I'm just marveling at, at your accomplishments. The suitcase, how many of you have used your suitcase here in Open, uh, open Sim for the uh, hypergrid, right? I certainly included librarians. And, and you'll notice I said curators, too. You could be both, right? Librarians could be curators. Uh, many of you are curators. You, you archive and store content. Mystic mentioned she loves shopping. She's a curator of sorts, right? Absolutely. And some of us, I love all these plus ones. This is great. I've never had plus ones during a talk. And this is my 121st talk. What's interesting is I'm painfully shy, in case you guys didn't know this. And so 
these worlds empower us to, to have a voice beyond our own limitations, and that's something that's important to realize. Now, Lightful's in the crowd, and this is one of her builds from a, from a games and simulation class that we taught in, in uh, January through March. And this is Pandora's Garden. And I love this shot. I've shown it a couple of times at conferences. It's so mesmerizing. I set the environment to the eye of Mauron, you know, for the, for the daytime look, because I wanted this rosy red to permeate her build. And as you step inside, you'll notice the students, some of them are transforming because they've been participating in a game. So some of them won wings and various other badges and other stuff. And at the entryway, she says, knowledge is, choice is power. And I always add to it, knowledge is power as well. But here she's giving a presentation and she's in the back center, right next to Pandora's box. And she's opened the box and all kinds of chaos and negative things have permeated the world. Things that we needed to be able to appreciate the things that we have. And as she's giving this presentation, it's not death by PowerPoint. And I know you guys are going, hey, but you're showing PowerPoint. Well, she's transforming to the phoenix. And you can see her. She's the gold figure in the center back. And I find that so amazing, the fact that our students can do this, you know. And they wouldn't have been able to do this a few years ago, right? And, and uh, students on campus their minds are just boggled by this notion that people from other classes can come, guests can come, and we can have this shared communion. Now, I like to put my camera in strange places. I just want to warn you in case I ever visit your stuff, right? And here, we're standing in engineering. And I was thinking about, how many of you have seen the movie Metropolis? If you haven't, it's a wonderful movie by Fritz Lang. What subjects do I teach? Ah, uh, I designed a doctoral degree program in emerging media, AI, and um, that means I'm teaching web engineering, web technologies. I emerging media is not just about media. It's about the development of software and tools like OpenSim Simulator. It's about uh, the use of virtual worlds. It's augmented reality. It's the blending of web technologies, and it's the implications of the cultural uh, shift that comes from their use. So think of it as the tools, the technology, the media, and the culture. And I'm also interested in digital rights and privacy. I would, I, uh, my students hypothesize what will life be like now that we're giving up our geolocation and much of our privacy, what will life be like in 10 years? Will it be like Star Trek? Or, and you'll notice I'm showing an image here where some of the students have access to the LCARS database of textures. Uh, one of them is a game designer, and so they built this spaceship game, right? Uh, and as you go around through all the different departments, you're collecting and, and it, it's increasing your status and tracking your progress in the game. But I put my camera in the, in the floor between the two levels because I was fascinated, similar to the movie Metropolis by Fritz Lang. It's like 1929, 26. It's a silent film that Giorgio Moroder set to modern music back in the, what, 80s? Anyway, and uh, in that story, they talk about uh, the utopian city above and then the worker city below and this notion of this is how, how you create sustainable systems. And so when I listen to my students presenting their work, and their projects, I'm not just looking at what's on the surface, but I'm doing some deep thinking about why this matters. And I want you, I, I invite you to do the same thing today and to think about the art of the possible and how you're creating it, your position in our community. Now here I'm standing with a chat bot, you know, and an, and an alien, and, and uh, of course we're in sick bay, right? And uh, the notion of me being able to do this is very empowering. I loved Star Trek when I was growing up, and I loved all the science fiction. But I knew that I was never going to be in the space program, right? I mean, I, I've, I've collaborated with Gene Holm on a couple of papers and a couple of simulation and modeling conferences for the ACM. But I know I'm never going to space, right? But here, I can. And I can bring my students, too. And you'll notice that... Um, here they are, and uh, they're interacting with the chat bot and with one another. A delightful is looking, she's wearing a Grecian green dress in the back, backdrop on the right. And, and so we can transform our sense of identity and, and be whatever we need to be in, in, in the space that we're in. 
And I know you guys are all aware of this, so I know you're thinking, what are you going to tell me that's new? Well, how many of you are practicing Hudagaji? Uh, how many of you know what Hudagaji is? Let, let's start there. Hudagaji is uh, the creation of knowledge. And you guys are creators. Now, you may not be content creators. You may be idea generators. Uh, AI, you, ha you have a cue there. Uh, Hudagaji, and by the way, there's a wonderful site on the web uh, that tells you how to pronounce things. How do you say it? Anyway, in this case, my students were thinking about their, their assignment, and they were thinking about space, and they decided to create a game, and they also defined the learning goals, the game elements, and the pedagogy, and mapped it all together beautifully. Do you see how easy this is for an educator? I don't have to worry about grading the work. What I have to worry about is stimulating and keeping up with my students. Do you see how beautiful this is? Oh, hudagaji, that's constructivist. So you're creating knowledge, AI. For example, when you're an undergraduate or in high school or in grade school, we focus on pedagogy, which is, uh, it means several different things. But one of the things it means is the memorization of basic rules and facts. Uh, at the doctoral level, we don't go around memorizing things. We know how to look it up. So um, at the graduate level, we, we practice andragogy. How many of you are familiar with andragogy? And by the way, I'm a teacher. It, it's an occupational hazard, right? Andragogy is how adults learn, through trial and error. Most of you, when you try these things out, that's right, you can always look it up. But, but what I'm interested in is how you'll retain it and use it, AI. So andragogy is how you model your behavior, the fact that you don't, read the manual before you use software, you jump into the viewer, you start changing the preferences, and you have courage. Yes, go ahead, Linda. Go ahead and ask any questions you have. You don't have to raise your hand. I run interactive rooms, so I love to spin off the ideas of everyone in the audience. Now here, I have some things for you to think about as we're thinking about practicing hudagaji, right? And, and in the research, you are all researchers. Even if you're in business, even if your focus is arts and creativity, yes, you are a researcher and a mad scientist, okay? Yes. <laughs> well, the creation is important. It's vital to, um, to our existence in a sustainable virtual world. And you know why, right? Buffy, when you friended Stephen Hawking or when he friended you on Facebook, that was an important day for me. I wasn't there, but I was virtually. And by my connection with you, I feel akin to him. And isn't that amazing how we can all connect over these kinds of moments? The folks who are working um, to extend Moses and avatar scalability, this is a project that needs each one of you because we're, we're going for... Uh, an increasing number of avatars role-playing for two hours at least once a month or once every two months, right? And so we need more and more people to log in and to participate. The good news is all you have to do, and I'm not stealing anyone's thunder, I'm just giving you a little teaser for the, for the later sessions, okay? All you have to do is, is be a character and talk and walk, right? Uh, interact and help us test the server. Mick Bowman, the Intel Group, Kitty, and the others, uh, our hats are off to you for this effort with Doug Maxwell and the Moses team. Um, for portability, I love my suitcase. I just love the fact that now we've thought about portability and interoperability. It may not be the most um, widespread notion, but it's so exciting to me. The first time you experience it, and, and what you're seeing me wear is using the suitcase, right? So I, I find that a, a very viable um, discovery, and I want to see more of that kind of thing. Now, of course, we want to protect digital rights. So we need a way to think about it. And I know Sun Tzu is leading uh, research efforts on Sunday mornings. I think it's either at 11 or noon uh, Pacific time. Uh, you can get involved. You can participate. Right? So see Sun Tzu if you want to participate on that. They're first looking at content, portability, and commerce, uh, a marketplace, if you will. So th they're tackling that part of the problem space. Gesture-based interaction is hot right now, isn't it? Uh, we, I, I have the Leap Motion and the Connect, and I'm busy studying how to support a variety of, of uh, behaviors with it and, and to drive my avatar. 
the virtual human interaction lab uh, at Stanford keeps looking at facial tracking. The, the fact that I would be able to frown or smile here and you'd be able to see it on my avatar. I, I noticed several of you said, hey, my lips aren't moving. That's not very realistic. And you're right. However, it's a little cheesy when they do move because if you saw me in real life, you'd notice that I, am, I have, I'm constantly grinning or smiling or emoting in some fashion and I tend to gesture madly, right? Um, so I need not only these capabilities for facial tracking and motion capture, but I need the ability to turn them off, right? <laughs> to be able to have, a, have an expression that I'm not broadcasting. So I need pretty sophisticated tools, right? I want the capability and I want the control. Now, Teravis, you can let me know, but, but it's true. You see, you don't just want to be empowered. You want to have control as well, okay? Now, my love, wouldn't it be great if every book and every movie had a virtual scene, ha had something that kids and learners and even folks for social and entertainment could step inside and experience some part of the story? We did that with Of Mice and Men uh, for the Ramapo Project in Safern Middle School, and it was very empowering. The kids read the book, put it aside, and then stepped inside the scene, and they enacted the story after the book ends. And they asked themselves, you know, in, in Of Mice and Men, um, George kills his friend Lenny, who's, who's simple-minded, uh, to save him from torture and murder. And so at the beginning of the trials, 400 eighth graders, 413-year-olds said, Oh, uh, he's not guilty. He's not guilty because he loved his friend and he meant well. And at the end of four days of 40-minute trials where they thought about the testimony and they thought about what happened, they all convicted. And I asked them, I said, what changed your mind? That's pretty fast work to change your mind in four days, right? And they said, well, you know, due process doesn't say he meant well. It says beyond a reasonable doubt, did he kill his friend? And he, and he did. But we'll recommend a lighter sentence because he meant well. Now, the point to the story is, and of course that's featured also in the book, The Immersive Internet, in our chapter, but um, the point to the story is that we have these transformational moments that take kids from, from a complete reversal of opinion and a very mature line of thinking. And we can do it in four 40-minute sessions, which is almost like magic, if you think about it. It's, it's, it's really fast. Yes. Uh, what's amazing is on the fifth day, the kids ripped out the, um, and this is, of course, the immersive book notion again. Uh, the kids ripped out the courtroom scenes. They ripped out the benches and all, and they created a conference for another school to come by their school and see their virtual world. And they hung portraits of famous people and they put a little note card giver in it where it would tell their book report, their little biography. And, and I was walking through it. This is the fifth day, right? And I looked over and I said, oh, who's the, f there's a photo of a girl about two meters tall in profile smiling at, at me. And I said, well, who's this? I didn't recognize her. And one of the young women, the 13 year old said, why that's me. And these are all the things I'm going to accomplish in the next 15 years when I become famous. Well, I don't know about you guys, but I was just, it took my breath away and tears welled up because I'm not used to kids feeling empowered. Uh, I know t we have such mad technology today, you kind of wonder why they don't feel empowered. But I think they feel a little overwhelmed by it, a little like they're in cruise control. That media is there for socialization, but not for empowering them. And to see these kinds of worlds causing young women to have vision and to think about their future and have a plan for it, I, th I just thought was amazing. You know, um, so innovation, I, I'm encouraging widespread adoption. So what do we need? Well, these are the things I want, okay? Now, I'm sure you want even better things than I want. Uh, I like machinima, and I know that... Um, that Heike is here and she's running the Camelot project, you know, and she's going to be having a conference in February, the end of February, beginning of March, that's going to focus on that. So I welcome you to go to that. That's the seventh annual uh, SL Languages uh, sub annual symposium. Um, I want OARs and I want them for all these immersive spaces. I want them, in fact, 
uh, we started packaging for Christmas uh, as gifts for some of our family. We started putting Open Sim on there and creating a few avatars inside of it, a few regions. We loaded a few OERs in it. We created a little of our own content. And then we started distributing it to family members to load who had never been in a virtual world before. So they could run their own and then, of course, Hypergrid, and then we could go visit them in their own space. Do you know how empowering it is for a new user if they can install and use that within just a few minutes? And I know you're all thinking, ah, oh, the instructions are out on the web. What, why can't they follow the instructions and install it from scratch? And yet it seems so complex to them, right? How, what, did it feel complex to you the first time you, you created an OpenSIM grid? What well, is? Think about it, Mick. And then, and then you could also go visit them for the virtual holiday, right? In their own space, or figure out how you can connect with them. And see, I want to see more and more of these. I don't want to think of them as as one-offs. I want to think of them as widespread and rampant. I want to go viral with this because widespread adoption means that we have to empower people who are not used to doing these things and make it feel so natural and so comfortable that they're willing to do it not unlike the smartphone. Believe it or not, the smartphone is actually very complex. If you look at all the different apps and all the different, uh, you know, if you've ever tried to get control of your smartphone, that's when you realize it's, it's complex, right? And you give away all kinds of privacy to allow someone to remote install and, and have total control of your device. That's what's so interesting about it. But uh, it is very useful, absolutely. Now, you notice I added assessment, and that's because for education, without measurement, without an understanding that these, uh, these spaces offer something that's compelling and, and memorable, um, it's very hard to tie to the educational system. Now, I'm not thinking of tests, by the way. In fact, uh, in my classes, guess what I do? Uh, to encourage my students and to help them get over fear, um, I, I ask them questions and, a, and they answer in the chat log. And for every answer they give me that's spot on, they get 10 lindens. And I know it's only three cents, which is kind of cheesy. And you have to realize, I want them to have about 300 lindens so they can upload textures and PowerPoint slides and create viewers and start thinking about their content. So I, what I'm doing is seeding their budgets, you know. But... Uh, but I want them to feel incentivized, right? Uh, so I'm not using Sloodle, although we can, and we do in Loire, another open sim world in Dream, Dreamland Metaverse. But, um, but instead, yes, this notion of reward, Sun Tzu, uh, most of us love getting some money. And Mystic, some of my students, after they've uploaded their work and created their projects, will go and buy an outfit, right? And, of course, they feel so excited, you know, to be able to customize themselves. They then have a connection with the world and they are creators. And being a creator is a powerful thing. For the New Media Consortium, I used to teach little se sections on um, uh, programming for non-programmers. How educators who have no programming background can tailor their scripts or be empowered to create scripts and to figure out what are these behaviors and how can I control them, right? And that's the notion of a simulation, when all of a sudden you have not just a bunch of 3D scenes, right, not, and not just a, uh, interaction within them, but this notion of connection in the mind space. And that's what I want to see. Uh, we know why virtual worlds are on a decline. Uh, when there aren't people and there isn't interaction, the connection between people and content and experiences, then something is missing, right? That's right. Now, I like social research, too, and here's, this is myself and, and one of my family members dancing after one of our classes, and I think these kinds of moments are important. How many of you ever participated in Thompson Learn, Thompson's Learning? They're, they had those Cisco and uh, Microsoft certification classes. They were $1,000 classes. They're video content that they normally offer online, and they brought them into Second Life in 2006 through 2008. And they charged maybe a couple hundred lindens for a thousand dollar class. And you could get a certification. No one participated in that. It was pretty amazing. Yes, Buffy, I did too. And I kept going by to watch people dancing while they're studying. Now, I know we're running a little low, uh, um, um, close on time. So I want to show you a little bit of research. I want to show you things you haven't seen. How many of you have been on ProQuest UMI for the dissertations database? Not everyone has access to it, so I wanted to show you. Do you know how much research there is in virtual worlds? Um, 
over 3,652 different dissertations discuss it and research it, and 2,980 of them focus on education. So those of you who aren't educators, you may wonder why we keep talking about it. That's because we are building the business case for why these worlds are compelling and why the world should participate, okay? So, yes, and I think this is very encouraging. Every once in a while, one of my students says, oh, there's nothing out there. And every day, and this is why librarians and curators are so important, um, every day I'm in these collections looking up more and more, and I just marvel at how many voices have risen and, and are, have taken up the call, you know. And, and you notice 510 of them are on higher education. That means most of them are not necessarily thinking of university education. They may be thinking of adult education that's continuing education or nonprofit, or they're thinking about our kids, our future, right? Now, they've gotten away from 3D worlds, from calling it that, and 3 hyphen D is kind of outdated. That's why I included it there. There are only 38 that refer to them as 3D worlds, and I thought that was interesting. So gazing into the future, and I love this slide because this is my brain on fire. In 2006, I ran a little informal study. Have, have you guys ever done quirky little studies by yourself? Uh, maybe not for the benefit for, for humanity, but just for yourself. And one day I was interested in whether avatars had brains. So I, started, I went into wireframe mode for, for a few months, and I studied everyone around me to see if they had a brain. And it was kind of interesting. And I, I even showcased a little talk for the New Media Consortium on it. Now, in the, in the book, uh, the chapter we wrote, this is an edited, changed version of those projections. I teach futuring and innovation. So to answer your question, I teach computer science. I teach the entire software engineering life cycle. I teach students how to do game design and how to do um, a you, you not, you, how to use Grady Booch's UML right to to do two D depictions of software's behavior, and then I bring them into Second Life and I have them build their vision, actually create it, and then I have them experience the timing issues. And re uh, one of them had a sensor on a capture the flag game, and it was going off like 20 times a second. So it was spamming the chat log. And of course, they couldn't tell when they looked at the 2D diagrams that talked about software's behavior. But when they saw it in Second Life and they saw it uh, misbehaving, then they were able to fix it, uh, rerun it, and then test it and play the game. And that, that was very empowering, right? So I want you to realize that we've accomplished some of the things in the, in the one to five years, but they're not widespread. And when I say widespread, I mean major adoption, uh, more participants, more schools seeing the benefit. I spoke to the CACTA organization, which was mostly college presidents and provosts and people who are planners, chief technology officers and IT folks, and they all want to embrace virtual worlds but they find it very complex in how to start an open sim version. They need us to demystify the complexity, to make it easy for them to figure out how do I install and use this, okay? So we need to rethink how these things are done. Uh, I know they're very easy for you guys, but they're not easy for folks who have no background in it. Uh, you'll notice in my six to ten years, uh, I'm very interested in adaptive learning, which is different than assessment and lessons. It's more about knowledge construction. It's more about what do I know and what, do I, what don't I know. I participated in a National Science Foundation grant a few years back that had an intelligent tutor that would essentially kind of monitor your behavior. And if you didn't understand something, and it was pretty complex what it was doing, it would, um, it would show you a graphic of it of the mathematical modeling. It would show you a, a little instructional thing like the Wikipedia thing that someone mentioned earlier. And then it would also show a video. And if you didn't get the sense of behavior and problem solving and how it all, how it was deconstructed, the, the task and the subtasks, it would then send an alert to your instructor saying that Joe doesn't get it at this point. Please cover that better. Wouldn't it be nice if we only talked about things that were mysterious and uncertain and we didn't waste time in what we knew? And that's the notion of adapted learning, is focusing on what's fresh and, and, and mysterious, right? And figuring out how to help people build to comprehension, 
Okay. So, uh, and then I'd love to see educational MMORPGs, which are massive multiplayer online role-playing games. You notice my original slide, slide said I'm Lyrae the Insane. That's because of Jim Bailey and, and his family helped me to get the Insane title. As a community, we did an insane amount, number of quests and reputation over a five-month period to win that. And it felt like a major accomplishment. Now I would love to see those kinds of spaces, not just in World of Warcraft, but for education. Um, ancient spaces out of Oxford and the University of, uh, of Southampton was, uh, was building, um, they had their first year ancient Greek and civilization students building Maya models of Rome and ancient Greece. The goal was to create an MMORPG that that new students could step inside, do quests, and actually go through an archaeological dig, actually experience what is it like to do this. And think of it as a completely constructed student game, uh, constructed by students for students, right? And it was a, a major undertaking, and naturally, I'm not sure they ever finished. They had quite a few models and quite a few piece parts. It, it, but that vision is sustainable, and I'd like to see more people pick it up Imagine what, what our youth are going to experience based on our successes, okay? Well, how can you help to shape, shape the future? In, in, you see all these bullets here, and I love these wordles because they make me think a little differently about the subject. Technology advances certainly we need, but we also need tutorials, and we need them from people who understand what it takes to be less complex, to be very clear, to reach out and to communicate to different uh, communities of people, and to broaden our Gesellschaft, our own community. I would love to see uh, more metaverse-like spaces where we have our own wiki space, where we are so aware of one another that we can reach out and touch one another, uh, and we can share uh, content. <laughs> now, if you guys have any questions at this point, yes, you want better hair, and I don't blame you. I love, I love, I love all the content associated with identity because it stimulates our mind space. It makes us feel more comfortable and it makes us feel lively and engaged. All of these things are important. You'll notice Moses is on here, the open source development, all of that, all of those things are here. But we also need scenes and games and lessons and library collections and much, much more. But remember, we need a sustainable future. And this means we need our business users. We need folks who recognize that if everything always stays free, you know, uh, and I love free, don't, don't, don't get me wrong, uh, someone somewhere has to eat though, right? And so we recognize that we need a, a foundation of free content and then we need some sort of ecosystem that's sustainable, right? That recognizes the craft persons. Let's see, Ellie's adding here, talking about the barriers to adoption. Absolutely. Um, for Cloud Party, it has healthy participation. There's no mad rush to join. When I first joined at Ellie, and I have to admit, I'm a bit of a Philistine, right? I'm in seven different worlds, and then I, um, I sit on 45 research committees, and then there's Moses. So I have to admit, I'm spread a little thin, Ellie, which is my barrier to Cloud Party. Uh, so you're saying it got your attention, Sally and Chimera? Um, See, the nice thing about Cloud Party is the fact that if you can dream it up, you can participate in its evolution, right? And that's, uh, that's part of the charm. The difficulty for me is I needed tools that make me look good really fast, and I don't mean my hair and my clothes, right? I mean as a mad content creator, I feel like a magician. I feel like the wizard, you know, who has to whip stuff out, have holodecks kicking off, has scenes that are that are compelling, that pop out and then go away, you know, and I need, um, I need all those affordances because I'm kind of spoiled. That's the problem with technology that enables you is it kind of spoils you a little bit. And so um, you need a little bit of time, you know, to help with the evolution of new tools. The business aspects are critical, Sally, because uh, first off, we, we need a sustainable future and sustainability 
cannot always be free. Now, I'm not saying that open source tools won't always be free. That's not it at all. And by the way, uh, we have a defense coming up. Jason Murray has been validating the top 1% of the projects on SourceForge. And he uh, he's used several measurements. And he'll be giving a doctoral defense, a final defense on that, on September 14th. And I'm so proud of him. We're seeing such growth in the open source field. And, and I know all of you who have participated say, oh, it's always been growing. But now we're getting confirmation and use by the DOD, by business, by, by all of these users who have traditionally stepped back and said, well, that's community grown. How do we know it has integrity? So now we're looking at validation. Thank you, Rhiannon. And that's my last slide. I want to thank you all for coming. Does anyone have a, a last minute question before we move on? Now, I'll have these slides on SlideShare. I have to upload them. And I'll give you the URL where you can find them in case you want a copy. And yes, you're welcome to use them, to redistribute them, to use them in their entirety or in part. <laughs> and uh, with my permission. That's great. And here's the URL. There you go, Rhiannon. And thank you very much, everyone. Yes, and thank you, Lear. I'm sorry, we, um, you know, we were running a little late over everything in the start, too. You no know, um, worries. But thank you for a wonderful keynote. Um, always great to hear your point of view and hear more, de hear more about your work. Um, we'll be starting our afternoon sessions immediately following this, and you can see what's coming up next on the conference schedule at conference.opensimulator.org. Um, thank you again, Lear, to our, um, for presenting and, um, and also to our audience, and then everybody enjoy your afternoon sessions. We're going to swap out of here. And